one of the reasons we focus on the breath as the foundation of our meditation is to give you a good place to stand. Because lots of different emotions, lots of different ideas can come washing through the mind. And if you don't have some place outside of the mind where you can take your stance, you get washed away. Greed comes in, anger comes in, fear comes in. And they can be overwhelming. if you don't have a place to stand outside of them. So we focus on the breath as a way of getting outside of these overwhelming emotions to realize they don't have to take over totally. We can have at least one corner of our awareness where they're not, where they're not raging. Not only does the breath give us a place to stand, it also gives us some ammunition to use against these things. When anger comes, when fear comes, part of their power comes from the way they change the processes of the body. Your heart beats a lot faster. Hormones are being poured into your bloodstream. And when both your mind and your body are taken over by an emotion like this, The only thing that seems possible is just to give in. But you don't have to give in. You can work with your breath to counteract at least the physical side of the emotion first. And regardless of what's happening in the mind, you can still breathe calmly. In fact, this is an important way of retraining yourself. So even though scary thoughts or infuriating thoughts are coming through the mind, you can still breathe calmly. And they don't have to have such a total impact. So while we're meditating here, it's good to have practice and being sensitive to what kind of breathing feels good, where the different parts of the body are, where you find yourself getting caught in unskillful energy patterns. It's one of the reasons why John Lee has you focus on those centers in the middle of the head, the, the, the palate, the base of the throat, the middle of the chest, just above the, the navel, because these tend to be trigger points. Once the trigger point has been engaged, then everything else seems to catch up as well. So if you keep the trigger point relaxed, open, at ease. The other reactions in the body don't happen. You find that your body can be an ally against these emotions instead of just simply being part of the victim or part of their side. And being sensitive to the breath also helps you notice when these things are beginning to creep up on you, because sometimes they don't come full blast. They creep up a little bit and then they build and build and build. And if you're distracted, thinking about something else, aware of something else, you don't notice what's happening until it's they've taken over. This is why we emphasize being sensitive to the body, not only while you're sitting here meditating, but also as you go through the day. And if you know that you have particular trigger points, keep your awareness centered there and keep those spots open, regardless. First line of business. First order of business, no matter what happens, keep those spots open so the body doesn't get triggered. And so if something does start creeping up, you'll notice it. And you find that these emotions are a lot easier to deal with when you catch them right at the very beginning. 
before they trigger the hormones, before they trigger the physical reactions. Because otherwise, once those reactions are triggered, then you simply have to ride them out. And that may take a while. And of course, when the body starts reacting, you say, well, well, this anger this has taken over and it's constant and it's all there all the time. Well, it may not be there all the time. Maybe it comes and goes. But the physical reactions seem to be constant, and that gives you an impression that the anger is still there. Maybe the trigger, or the, the thought that triggered those reactions is long gone. But then you start seeing the reactions continuing and continuing and continuing, you think, well, gee, that, that emotion must still be there, and you dig it back up again. You're giving it more power than it really needs to have, or than it actually has. So you have to understand that even though the physical reaction is still happening, the mental trigger may have been long gone, and you don't have to take it back up again. You're just riding out the, the after effects of the emotion. And as long as you're determined not to be overcome or not be swayed by these things, you're okay. And that puts you in a position where you can start looking at them. Remember the Buddha said our emotions are composed of three components. The first is the physical, that's related to the breath. Then there's the verbal component, the thoughts and narratives that go along with the emotion. And then the, the third component is the mental component, the feelings and the perceptions, the mental labels, the concepts that underlie the thinking, that underlie the verbal side. And so once the physical side is relatively calmed down, or at least you've got a toehold here, then you can start looking. What are the thoughts, what are the ideas behind that particular emotion that got you going, the beliefs that got you going, the narratives? Do you have to believe them? Do you have to engage in them? Maybe there are other narratives that you could tell about the situation. And so you recast it. And if the object of your fear is genuine, it's not just a dream or a random idea that's come through, then you have to dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, well, even though there is this genuine danger out there, what's the most skillful way to respond? You simply give in to the fear, that's not going to help. If you ignore it, that's not going to help either. You've got an actual danger there you've got to deal with. So try to use your ingenuity to see how much you can prepare and what things you have to let go of. It's like riding out a storm. We have these huge wind storms here. And all you can do is just hide out in your hut, hide out in your tent, and hope nothing falls on you. But in the meantime, all kinds of damage is being done outside. But you can't do anything about it in the course of the storm. But you can protect your mental state. Wait till the storm has passed, and then go out and survey the damage. And a lot of times you find the, the fears and the anger and, and all these other unskillful emotions come from holding on to things laying claim to things that simply leave you exposed. A particular relationship, a particular job, a particular way of doing things, your body. As long as you continue to lay claim to these things, you're, you're open to the fear, you're open to the difficulties. You have to remind yourself, these things are not me, these things are not mine. And this often comes down to fear of death, especially if you're in physical danger. And you do what you can to protect yourself, but you realize also that you've got the precepts. There's some limitations on what you can do to protect yourself and still maintain the skillfulness of the mind. 
in the forest tradition, when a monk is sent out to go to a dangerous forest or a place where there's either disease or dangerous animals, the teacher will say, almost sarcastically, are you afraid to die? And everybody would normally say, well, of course, yes. But in the forest tradition, you're supposed to think about, well, maybe I have to be ready to die no matter what. Maybe I can stay in a safe place and still die, which of course can happen. You surround yourself with all kinds of protection, and you've still got the inner workings of your body. That can kill you. So you have to learn how to induce that state of mind. Says no. I don't have to be afraid. I have to realize that I am not the body. The body has been a very useful tool. It's been very helpful. But there's going to have to come a point where you have to let it go. So why not practice thinking that way now? So when death actually does come, you're prepared. You've been practicing. There's a great passage in the, in the canon where this monk is going off to a dangerous land, and the Buddha says, the people there are dangerous, you know. They're known to be very harsh, very cruel, barbaric. What are you going to do if they denounce you? He says, well, I'm going to think these people are really good and that they're not hitting me. What if they ha hit you? Are these people are very good and civilized and that they're not stabbing me. What if they stab you? Well, they're good and civilized and they're not killing me. What if they kill you? Well, at least my death won't be a suicide. The Buddha says, okay, you're, you're prepared to go. This is working with that metal fabrication. That the perception of this body is me, and if this, the body gets killed, that's the end. Wipe out, total annihilation. You have to remember, remember, that's not the case. There's still something that survives, and you want it to be able to survive in good shape, i.e. carrying lots of good karma with it, so you don't want to die in the midst of doing something unskillful. Sometimes when we're discussing the precepts, people will bring up situations, well, what if, what if, some, if you don't lie, someone's going to kill you? Well, then how do you guarantee that when you lie, they're still not going to kill you? are still not going to kill the people you love. What would that be like? You go ahead and lie and they kill you. At the very least, make sure that what you're responsible for, your actions, okay, you stay within the precepts, you stay within the bounds of what's skillful. And the knowledge that you've done that can give you a lot of strength. So this is how we take apart unskillful emotions. You take apart the physical side, and then the verbal side, and the mental side. You have to learn that for the mental side. You have to learn how to think outside the box. And same with the verbal side, because the verbal here they're talking about your inner chatter, what you say to yourself. And a lot of times, what you say to yourself can be a lot more harmful than what people do outside. So that's part of your training. is learning how to think in skillful ways. There's a widespread misunderstanding that the most important part of the practice is mindfulness, in which they tend to identify simply as bare awareness, simply watching things in a non-reactive way. But that's not what the Buddha said. The most important part of the practice is something called appropriate attention, where you learn to look at the situation and divide it up into four categories. Where is the stress? Where is the cause of stress? What would be the cessation of that stress, i.e., by abandoning the cause? And then how do you do that? What's the path of practice by which you do that? In other words, you see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And you realize that each truth has a task, which has to be mastered as a skill. That's very different from the idea of simply not being reactive or learning to accept whatever comes. If you see that a particular line of thinking is causing a lot of stress and suffering, you've got to change that line of thinking. And sometimes to drop that, I mean, abandoning is the, the task that you do with the cause of stress. And to drop it, you actually have to change it, think in the opposite way.
deep down you feel this body is me. Well, what if it's not you? How does that change things? My preferences are me. Well, what if they're not you? How does that change things? So it's not just a matter of watching or being just aware of things. If you see that something unskillful, you've got to counteract it. And to counteract it, you've got to ask yourself, what are your underlying assumptions? The things we say, of course, to. And learn how to question that, of course. Think of all the great advances in science. It's of the people who question the of course. Why do apples fall out of trees? Well, it's their nature to fall. That was what was believed at the time. And you had Isaac Newton saying, well, maybe not. Why? And people made fun of him for asking why. But then he ended up coming up with a totally different explanation. Not only does the apple fall, but the earth rises to the apple a little bit. Of course, now people are still trying to figure that one out. Why is there gravity? But it's by learning how to ask those really basic questions, that's where you gain in advance. You begin to see, oh, this is something I believed all along without even thinking about it, without examining it, and it's causing me suffering. To learn down, to dig down and question those assumptions. Because they're holding you captive. Or by holding on to them, you're making you're keeping yourself captive. So learn how to question, learn how to let go. Learn to turn things inside out. It's like turning your pockets inside out in your, in your clothes. You find the interesting things in your pockets sometimes you didn't realize you had. So we work with the breath to give ourselves a foundation where we can start asking questions like this and looking into the mind to see where the problems are and apply that set of categories of, the, of appropriate attention and the Four Noble Truths. Remind ourselves that meditation is not just a single activity where you're just mindful or just accepting or just non-reactive. But it's one where there are lots of different things you could, or lots of different approaches you could apply to the present moment. Learning how to figure out which one is appropriate right now and learning how to master it as a skill. That's the most important element to bring to the meditation. Because that's the line of thinking that can make you free.